Greetings, fellow apes of planet Earth. This is attorney Andrew Markintel, attorney Mark J. Victor. We're the attorneys for freedom, and you are listening to the Peace Radical Show. Mark, how's it going, brother? Everything's great, man. I love the new opening. (laughs) (laughs) I love the fellow apes. Just trying a couple of different things. I'm really excited about our guest that we got today. Me too. So we got uh, Dr. Jeff Singer, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Jeff, how you doing? Very good, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a general surgeon here in Phoenix metropolitan area. I've been practice since 1981 in private practice. Uh, I'm originally from New York where I went to medical school, but I came out here to do my residency and stayed. I'm also uh, uh, a life, I guess you would say lifelong libertarian. I, was, I, I self-identified as a libertarian when I learned what the definition of the word was back in undergraduate college days. And I'm a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., which is a libertarian think tank. And I work mainly in the area of health policy studies. Love it. And um, what we've been trying to do, Mark and I have been trying to get as many people involved in the freedom world from as many different backgrounds as we can to kind of um, talk about different aspects of this live and let live movement that we're trying to put forward. And uh, I think we have an excellent opportunity today to talk to somebody who's very dialed into the health world. Um, So I think uh, what we were discussing doing is talking about the pandemic today, talking about COVID pandemic and getting your feedback on everything from how the government has responded to it and uh, how we've rolled out the vaccine and the efficacy of the vaccines. So why don't we kind of jump into that? Sure. Sure. Tell us about your work at Cato. Well, I I work in a lot of different areas that intersect with health policy, but of course, once the pandemic hit the scene a little over a year ago, being that uh, I'm an MD and one of the few practicing physicians who is actually in the trenches as opposed to in administration at any of the Washington, D.C. think tanks, it kind of became a natural for me to get involved with this issue. It felt to me to to, uh, give my opinions on it. And um, so I've been doing a lot of studying about it and a lot of writing, a lot of speaking, and I've even testified before Congress on on the issue. Um, I'm one of these, I've always been one of these uh, glass half full type guys. I guess to be a libertarian, you sort of need to be a glass half full type guy because you're always holding out hope for liberty. (laughs) And and so I'm looking at the, the sort of the silver linings in this COVID pandemic. I think as bad as it has been, and as many restrictions to our freedom of movement and our liberty that we've seen over the last year, there have also been some really fantastic lessons that we can learn from the pandemic that many uh, governors and and other lawmakers uh, tacitly understand by some of their actions. Uh, And hopefully when the pandemic is over and the emergency situation is finally put down, you know, finally passes, um, they'll take stock from these lessons and not, and and, and make the necessary uh, reforms. And for example, there's a whole host of regulations that stood in the way of a rapid and effective response when the virus first hit the scene. And uh, first off, getting the tests out. So we have this very creaky old system where the FDA gives emergency use authorization for tests. And when the, the COVID-19 virus was initially isolated by the Chinese, it was immediately, its genome was immediately shared with the World Health Organization, which then shares it with the rest of the world so that uh, labs could make tests off of the genome. That's the PCR test. <clears throat> and it's not a very difficult uh, thing to do. That, that technology has been perfected for a while. So the, uh, the, C, the, the CDC received the, the genome, and the FDA, for all intents and purposes, sent out word that we want the CDC to develop the test, and that if anybody else wants to develop a test, you first have to run it by the CDC before we'll even consider giving emergency use authorization. So the CDC starts working on a test. Meanwhile, in many other countries, in South Korea, in Europe, uh, there was a biotech company in Germany that came up with a test. They're using it. But in the United States, we're waiting for the CDC to come 
forth with its test. And when finally in late February of last year, it was decided, you know what, this thing looks like it's going to be a serious thing after all, the CDC starts sending its tests out, but it only had a limited number of state labs that it was going to give it to. And not only that, when this limited number of state labs received a small number of tests that the CDC developed, they were duds. They didn't work. They were faulty. And they had to go back to the drawing board. So this was the kind of thing I'm, I always thought to myself, you know, we're supposed to be the country that's the example to the world of how free markets work. Yet we had this centralized uh, bureaucracy that you would have expected to see in the former East Germany. And our lab test was like the Trabant, the former East German car, a dud. So anyway... And so all those tests that you were mentioning in Europe and everything like that, those were all developed by private companies, and those got out quickly. Yes, yes. In fact, in South Korea, uh, because they learned from their previous uh, the SARS and MERS pandemics, uh, they just set a new rule. Their, their equivalent of the FDA said, if we have a pandemic... All you guys in the private sector who think you could develop this, just develop them. Don't wait for us. Just keep us in the loop, and we'll kind of review retroactively to see if there's any problems. But just get going. Just do it. It's an emergency. (laughs) But in the United States, no, no, no. Everybody wait for the CDC, and anybody else who has an idea, first run it by the CDC, which sent a message to all the other private sector actors that the CDC is on this, so we might as well not bother. So did this that remain? Did that remain the getting rubber stamped by the CDC to develop the test? Did that remain in place, or did we eventually loosen up those restrictions? Yeah, eventually the FDA, uh, after catching a lot of flack too, and realizing that they were they had a lot of ground to make up, by mid March they eventually said, you know what? If anybody's uh, got a test, start going on it. They would they started copying the other, what some other countries were doing. More importantly, none other than the wonderful beacon of liberty, uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, started complaining, saying, you know, we got a state health lab that has a test, and we'd like to start using it on New Yorkers, but we can't because we have to go through the stupid FDA, CDC thing. Uh, We want to be able to use a test. And finally, in mid-March of last year, the the FDA said, you know what, any, this is is an emergency, this is temporary, it's not permanent, but any, any, uh, um, Governor of any state, if you want to authorize any intrastate lab test, go ahead and do it. It's not going to be FDA approved, but it's going to be New York approved or California approved or Arizona approved. Just do it. And in fact, the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, his maybe he had a little connection. His wife is South Korean. Um, it, it was a big news event where he greeted this uh, Korean Airlines plane at the Baltimore airport that had, I think it was 500,000 uh, COVID PCR tests from, made by a Korean company. And he met the plane and took these 500,000 COVID tests and distributed them among Marylanders so they can get some tests. So here you had, a, a, and that under the, under the emergency terms, the governor was actually able to say, I'm even going to allow tests that are made not even in the United States. So... Um, as of now, these, these emergency uh, rules are still in place. Uh, eventually, m- more and more of these tests got FDA uh, actual authorization from the FDA. But um, there's one example of the FDA tacitly realized, the regulators tacitly realized, you know what? We're in the way here. We're going to get out of the way. Um, then you have uh, many, many states, well, first of all, State licensing laws, not just in healthcare, but in every field, stand in the way of the free movement of people to engage in peaceful transactions. Uh, Arizona is, is is one of the more, I would say, more more reformist states in in this way. In 2019, Arizona became the first state to to enact what's called universal occupational licensing, which it's a step in the right direction. Basically, he said, if you have a license in good standing in any one of the uh, the 50 states and territories and you want to move to Arizona, you don't have to go through the whole licensing deal. You could just, you know, our, our state licensing agencies will issue you a license after they verify that. There's some downsides. You still got to move here. You can't, you know, be from a distance. But that was a big step, and now nine other states have copied that. But generally speaking, licensing laws, they protect the incumbents from competition, they don't necessarily 
provide any safety to the to the consumers. And uh, medical licensing laws, in particular, are an egregious example of that. For example, I have an Arizona medical license. And this is the same in every state. As a person who's gotten a license to practice medicine, I can practice any kind of medicine I want. It's within my scope. So even though I trained as a general surgeon, I got board certified in general surgeon, that's all I've been doing for the last 40 years or so. I actually, this is true, I've taken a very deep interest in addiction medicine and psychiatry. And I've spent a lot of time studying it. I've gone to meetings. Uh, I, so it's something that I'm not ignorant of. If I decided, you know what, I like this so much, I think I'm going to become an addiction specialist and psychiatrist. There's, according to Arizona license law, and this is the same in every state, I could just change the shingle on my door from general surgeon and put under my name addiction medicine and psychiatry. Nothing stops me from doing that. But I have a license. Does that mean, would you want to go to me? I mean, maybe. I might be very good, by the way. But here's what prevents me. Here's what protects the public. Private third-party uh, uh, mediators. So, for example, let's say uh, now I applied for privileges at a hospital in addiction medicine and psychiatry. I want to be a, uh, an attending in that, in, the, in that specialty. The first thing, the credentials committee of this private organization is going to ask me is, so where did you do your uh, residency in addiction medicine and psychiatry? Have you taken a board exam or anything like that? Uh, no, but I've taken a lot of weekend courses and I've read a lot and I really, I really feel like I know a lot about this. Uh, okay, well, we need you to show us that you, you know, completed a, a, a training program and took an exam or we're not going to let you come on our staff. That's one way the private sector protects the public. <clears throat> Another way is third-party certification organizations. These are private organizations. If I want to say that I'm board certified, you know, I have to convince them. I have to have done a certain, I have to have a certain amount of years of experience, pass an exam. Uh, most of them nowadays re re require you to retake an exam every so often. And that's an independent organization that's giving a seal of approval to me that the public can use to decide whether or not they, this guy knows what he's doing or he's just decided to call himself that. And then finally, there's tort law. So for example, you know, most, I would say if you're gonna practice medicine, you probably ought to buy liability insurance because there's a good chance you're gonna get sued one day. Well, so if you, right now, of course, I have malpractice insurance to cover me for surgery. If, uh, if I decided I wanna now become an addiction specialist, my malpractice insurance carrier is gonna say, Guess what? Could you tell us where you did your training in addiction medicine? And have you taken a board exam in this? Or in no, no, but I really feel like I'm good at this. I really think I could do this. And they'll say, well, that's good, but we're not covering you for that. We're covering you for what you are trained to do. If you want to do that, good luck to you. We're not going to stop you, but we're not going to be here to protect you if you get sued. Okay? So these are ways in which the public's protected, not by my license. My license just checks to make sure I a, don't have any felony convictions, I haven't been accused of uh, assault of any of my patients, things like that. But in terms of quality of care and service, that's done in the private sector all the time. But what my license, what the license does do is keep out-of-state doctors from competing with me or out-of-the-country doctors, and it keeps a nice, tight uh, club in my state. Otherwise known as protectionism, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it basically like a cartel. Yeah. But, so so that's, that's what licensing does. Well, during the pandemic, many governors realized, oh my God, we, we're getting swamped. The hospitals are getting filled up with patients. Uh, people are not allowed to go outside right now and they're isolated. They can't get to their doctor. We need more health care. So m most states, in fact, like possibly all of them, but the great majority, the governor said for the next several months during the course of this emergency, we're suspending the license requirement. If you've got a license to practice in any one of the 50 states, and you want, and not just medicine, nursing, uh, all sorts of health, behavioral health, then and you want to come here and help our patients, come on, well, you're welcome, okay? In fact, New Jersey went a step further on foreign doctors. We're one of the most restrictive countries on that. In, 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 our, in this country, um, <clears throat> it's just every state's license laws are pretty much identical. So if you uh, went to a medical school in another country, an accredited medical school, and you wanna become a specialist and practice in the United States, well, if when you graduate that medical school, 
you're lucky enough to score a visa and get into a residency program in the United States and complete your residency program in the United States, then that state will grant you a license, okay? But supposing uh, you, let's say you're from war-torn Syria, okay? And this is an example. I'm bringing this out of personal experience because I know somebody. And um, you went to medical school in maybe in, in England. You came back to Syria. You're board-certified general surgeon, and you've been taking care of a lot of trauma patients. You've been working there for 10 years. You're licensed to practice in Damascus, Syria, okay? And you, you want to get the heck out of Syria. You want to come to America. So um, as far, and you're, you're an experienced surgeon. Every state will say, well, since you didn't do your residency program in the United States, we're not going to grant you a license unless you repeat that program in the United States. So here you're somebody maybe in your late 30s, early 40s, you've got a family, and are you ready to go back? First, you've got to find a residency program that will take you. Are you ready to go back uh, uh, and start all over again? So many of, of, of these doctors are, you know, waiting tables, driving Uber. Uh, some are working in fields that are in the healthcare field. So, so like a residency program can accept a foreign doctor's um, medical yeah. degree? I mean, they can yeah, choose. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, with, uh, with uh, law school, for example, you need a, a United States accredited, you know, bar accredited degree that well, you can show. Well, there's a similar thing here. There's a thing called ECFMG, the Educational Council for Foreign Medical Graduates. And that'll, uh, uh, that's, it's the American, uh, the Association of American Medical Colleges is a part of it. But basically, they're an accrediting agency that accredits foreign medical schools. But there's a large list of medical schools that they accredit. And if you're from one of those schools, the hard, I could tell you uh, one of the hardest parts uh, is uh, immigration part. Because if you're a big medical university with a lot of money, usually you hire immigration lawyers and you get this person a visa to come to practice it, to do a residency program. But if you're a small organization, like a, a community hospital, like we see in a lot of the residency programs here in the Phoenix area, you just don't have the, the juice to, uh, to, to get this applicant a visa. So you tend to unfortunately say, gee, you know, this guy looks like he could be good. I'd like to take him, but we just, we're just going to have to go for a, an American because we just don't have the, the, the wherewithal to get, to, to get this guy a visa. So, but meanwhile, you have a, uh, so I personally, I, 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 like I say, I've been a surgeon a long time. I can remember for a number of years I'd be doing surgery, uh, and there's this guy, uh, I'm just going to call him by his first name, Jamil, and he was uh, an OR tech, so he's the guy who passes instruments, you know, so you put your hand out, you know, scissors, he missed that, and you put your arm, you know, like in the movies. So, so um, I'd be in some uh, really complex cases where there's some t tough decisions to make in the middle of the surgery, and... Most of the OR techs, they're just kind of passing you the instruments. They don't necessarily know what's going on in your head or what the, what the issues are that you're dealing with or the ramifications. But this guy would be always saying things like, have you thought about approaching it by going around uh, you know, the, the pancreas? Or maybe you can mobilize the, the spleen. And he'd be saying things like, like a surgeon. you know. And I'd say, that's a good idea. I, Thanks for suggesting it. I think I'm going to do that. And that would happen a lot. And then one day I said to him, you, you, when I operate, your head's in my case, and you're giving me some good, good advice. How do you know all this stuff? And he says, oh, I, I practiced general surgery for 10 years in Syria. <laughs> I said, really? He says, yeah. Uh, so I said, why aren't you general surgery? Well, you know, I... Don't I wasn't restart about, I wasn't, the residency. Uh, yeah, so he, uh, it turns out he, like a lot of immigrants, full of, of uh, energy and, and very entrepreneurial. So he started a small Mediterranean restaurant on the side while he was working as an OR tech. And eventually he went to do that full time. And now he's got it. But, but he, you know, he loved being in the OR. He loved medicine so much that he was working for not a lot of money as an OR tech just to be near it. And you think how many people, that talent's going to waste, right? So the governor of New Jersey, uh, back in, I think it was April or May of last year, again, during the pandemic, he said, Here's what we're going to do. Any, uh, any licensed healthcare practitioner from another country who's been practicing, I think he said five or more years. I don't know. But I think it was right now. Uh, you can come here to help us out in New Jersey. Wow. Um, but you can only do it at certain designated places where there are New Jersey licensed doctors to kind of oversee you and take responsibility. 
Okay, so that was the first step. Now, in, in most countries, and I'm talking about most of the developed world, they have a thing called provisional licensing, where mm -hmm. um, they'll say, uh, if, if you're from one of, uh, th there's, a, there's another international organization that accredits uh, medical schools as well, and if you're from one of these, a uh, 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 medical school accredited by your country, um, and you've, you, you have a license in good standing in that country, they have a, every country varies on how they do it, but basically what they do is they come up with a way where you have to take the same exam that every person in the country you're immigrating to has to take. So, you know, there's like an American national licensing exam, U.S. medical license exam, but there's a Canadian version and there's a British version, et cetera. So you've got to take the same test that they, everybody else has to take, and you, you got to show uh, some bo the board, you know, your experience, and then they'll grant you uh, a provisional license to practice usually with some person in your special, your field, who's uh, on a list who'll take you into their practice and is assuming responsibility for you. And then after one year, so like you're an employee of a clinic or something, then after one year, uh, if that person uh, certifies that you are competent, then you're allowed to go practice if, uh, with, with no, no conditions. You're given an un unconditional license. Some of the countries say, but for the first two years, you gotta practice in an underserved area and then restrictions are lifted. But the point is, every country has come up with, in the EU, for example, there's so many different countries there, they've come up with ways of, of allowing skilled foreign people who wanna come to your country and practice their, their skill, they've come up with ways to allow them to. Here it's much harder. So we're just talking about licensing. Then we have telemedicine. So telemedicine is not a new technology. I mean, it's been around probably before this century started. Well, before we move on to telemedicine, yeah. let, me yeah. get your, let me get your feedback on something. And it's the first time I've ever thought of it in the in context of medicine, now hearing you talk about it. Because, for example, with lawyers, I'm just speaking from my perspective of what I know, and I know that it makes sense from a lawyer's perspective, considering that all 50 states have different legal systems and there's differences among them, uh, to require licensing in a particular community in order to practice there. But I don't imagine it's uh, there's certain ways of doing surgery or there's certain medical truths in Delaware that don't exist in California or anything like that. What's the advantage, if any? Are there any discernible advantages besides this kind of cartel um, crackdown on competition to licensing per state for medical professionals? I, I don't see any. If you look at the history, originally the American Medical Association was founded back in the 1840s with the among its missions was to get states to license doctors. Licensing in general was considered an alien concept. Back in the early 1800s, uh, they were going around to state legislatures saying, you know, you need to license doctors in this state. You don't know uh, who's good and who's bad. You need to license them. And th they were generally rebuffed with license. You don't need a license. This is a free country. Just do what you do. Well, what happens if there's a bad doctor? Well, they'll, they'll it won't take long for people to find that out. That was the reaction. But after the Civil War in the later 1800s, occupational licensing be became more uh, known and acceptable. And it was around the 1890s, early 20th century, that states start, the state chapters of the American Medical Association started fighting successfully to get the licensing of doctors. Why? What was the, mo what was the, the motive? The motive was to protect them from competition, from other other doctors. In the early days, in many states, it was sort of like, uh, I, I may be a little bit out of, out, of, out of my lane here, but my understanding is in, in, this, in Hollywood, if you want to get an acting job in a movie, you have to have a SAG card. But you can't get a SAG card until you've done a couple of acting jobs. So it's one of those cast 22s. Mm -hmm. Usually you find somebody who really likes you and they get this waiver. So it's this, it was this, in the early days, it was the same way in medicine. So if you want, the, 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 most of the early licensing boards were f basically staffed by the state chapter of the Medi American Medical Association. So if you wanted to get a license, you better join the state chapter of the American Medical Association. And they had certain rules. Like, for example, you can't contract with a, uh, a benevolent association like the Knights of Columbus or something like that to be the doctor for the people in that 
mutual aid society. You can't. You can't contract with a corporation to provide health care. You have to be in private fee-for-service practice, or we're kicking you out of the AMA. That was things like that. So they had to, in, in fact, um, the AMA st started accrediting medical schools, okay? And then um, um, state licensing boards, which again were dominated by the state chapter of the AMA, would say, we're not gonna grant a license to anyone who didn't graduate an AMA accredited medical school, okay? And then um, back in the early 20th century, some, there were medical schools that were two years, there were four years, some were apprenticeships. This is the early days of medicine before it became so complex with the science we have today. Um, and um, uh, the uh, AMA uh, and, the, and the Carnegie Foundation commissioned what was called the Flexner Report. Abraham Flexner was a very famous educator. And he reported to them on what he thought would be an ideal medical education. And the ideal medical education, first you had to have a, a, at least a bachelor's degree from undergraduate school, because it wasn't required at that point. Uh, and in Europe, you don't have to. You can go on a six-year track right out of high school to medical school. So you had to have a bachelor's degree, and there are all sorts of requirements about what needs to be taught at the medical school, and a certain amount has to be devoted to research, et cetera, et cetera. And the AMA adopted Flexner's uh, uh, recommendations, and as a result, something like half of the medical schools the accredited medical schools in the country disappeared. This is around 1914. They disappeared because they didn't meet Flexner's uh, requirements. Interestingly, that's when uh, a couple of things happened. Uh, most of the African-American medical schools, because there was a lot of segregation in those days, so they, many times they had to form their own medical schools, they disappeared because they didn't, even though they had a better student-teacher ra ratio, they disappeared because they didn't meet Flexner's re requirements. And uh, women, comprised at least half of the doctors in those days. Some, in the 1800s, they were the majority. Um, but they started to become a, a distinct minority after that, mainly because medical school now became so expensive that the only people who could afford to go were usually people from affluent families. And uh, in those days, you didn't want to spend money on the, the female because she's just going to get married and have kids. So you put the money into the male. And so that's when women started disappearing from med schools. Now, of course, they're back, but, but this is the only, this is what happened. So I don't know how we got off onto this subject, but. Well, let's reel it, <laughs> let's reel it back in a little bit because it seems to me if I was going to put a sort of a category title on what you're talking about, uh, and you'll correct me if I get this wrong, you're saying, look, uh, some of the things we learned from this whole corona experience is there's just way too much bureaucracy and red tape in our healthcare industry. And uh, as a result of the emergency created, created by the corona virus pandemic, we've stripped some of this away, and this is a good thing. So from where I'm sitting, I want to get your thoughts on something, just sort of watching how the whole thing unfolded. Um, you started making the case right at the beginning that uh, because of the government bureaucracy, we were right right out of the beginning uh, b behind because we didn't have enough tests. And we didn't have enough tests because the CDC was basically the guardian of all tests. Basically monopoly. A monopoly of all tests. And, but I watched as the pandemic unfolded, and I watched those evil multinational corporations, one after another, step up and offer... Uh, to make respirators. Remember Ford Motor Company, I think GM, several other companies said, look, uh, we got a shortage of PPE. No problem. We're going to step up. We're going to start making it. Um, we're going to make the ventilators. Some companies, I remember when they were closed down from making uh, alcohol or beer or whatever, started making the hand sanitizer. Remember, they got in trouble because they didn't have the license to make the property. The bureaucracy got in the way. And then it was the private companies, the same evil uh, big pharma that stepped up and created the one weapon we have to fight this thing, uh, the vaccine, right? It wasn't the government. It was the private companies. And then the government said, you know, we have got to, we, we saw this thing coming, right? For months and months and months, the vaccines are coming and we're going to distribute the thing. And what did they do? They pressed the button and said, send it to UPS and FedEx, right? A two big evil a capitalist, multi, uh, multinational corporations to distribute the thing. And then 
Uh, the government, of course, was going to set up these sites, and they screwed all of that up, right? They couldn't get the tests. Uh, they couldn't get the needles in arms. And then what are they going to do? Let's call a Walgreens, and let's call CVS, and the private sector again stepped up. And so the one big weak link we had in the chain here was the entire healthcare industry, right? From what I could see, completely unprepared to deal with the pandemic. No PPE, no communication between hospitals, no communications about which emergency rooms are full and which ones aren't full to shuffle people around, hard to move doctors and nurses in. We had a shortage of nurses to begin with. There weren't enough nurses to service people. Why did we have this problem in the healthcare industry? Why were they the weak link? Because of regulations that stood, even PPE. And if you want to develop and market a mask, you have to get FDA approval for that. And that could take several months to get it approved. Now, all of these things were relaxed. You talk about the vaccines, which are, <clears throat> you know, one of the, uh, the miracles. I've, I've, in my entire career as a, as a physician, I've never seen such effective and safe vaccines as these. It's really impressive. Now, a lot of people were understandably skeptical because, wait a minute, we were told it could take two years or more to get a vaccine. Actually, under ordinary circumstances, it could take even 10 years to get a vaccine to market because of the regulations. And you got a vaccine here like in eight months. Um, of course, the, the reason why we got it so quickly is because a lot of the regulations were relaxed. So it's not as if they, the trials were just done on a tiny number of people and now, okay, looks good, let's bring it to market. They were done on large numbers of people that normally... There's usually a stepwise process. There's, you know, there's phase one trials, phase two trials, phase, and usually by the time you get up to the large numbers, that could be a, a year or two away. But the FDA basically said you could go ahead and accelerate that whole process and, and, and compress it. And so here we are with vaccines that, you know, are clearly very effective. This is our ticket out of this thing. And um, people uh, are saying, well, I don't know, this was too quick. When me, as a, my reaction was, Oh, so you can do it this quick when you get out of the way, huh? That was my reaction. This shows how, how more efficient and quickly we can get drugs and vaccines to people when we don't have all of these obstacles uh, and it's micromanagement. It's important also to understand that there's this precautionary principle that's always at work when you have regulatory agencies. Uh, Frederick Bastiat talked, he had an essay about that which is seen and that which is not seen. And that governs the way uh, bureaucrats work. It governs the way our political leaders work. So uh, an example, when, when um, the states, almost every state back in March of last year started locking down, right? Some for longer than others. All right, so since that time, we've learned a lot, of course. We've learned, among other things, that states that lock down real hard, like California right next door to us, and, and it's just, it's still not out of lockdown. They, apparently they're scheduled in mid-June to completely emerge. And then states like here in Arizona, where we've been relatively, compared to the rest of the country, free and unlocked down. At the worst, we're not any worse off than they are. Actually, we're better off than they are per capita. But even if we, even if we weren't better, we're not any worse off in terms of COVID deaths and hospitalizations, et cetera. And we're certainly a whole lot better off in terms of economic activity and well-being and mental well-being, et cetera, because we've been enjoying more freedom all this time. So we learned that, but so that basically there's no evidence that a lot of these lockdowns do anything except harm people and this, don't, don't stop the course of the virus. Is this consistent throughout the world when we look at country compared to country? Yeah, but it's very difficult to make a real accurate comparison because no two places have done exactly the same measures. Uh, you know, in the early days when Sweden had a light touch, sort of like ours and Florida's, they were criticized. But now, you know, a year later, they're in much better economic shape than most of Europe. And they're about middle of the pack in terms of... Uh, death statistics and, and hospitalization statistics, which, you know, it's not like they're the best, but they're certainly a lot of, they're a lot better off than a lot of other countries that were much more restrictive. So all of this makes you, ha you have to, a rational person has to question how much of these restrictions that leaders have put into place are really kind of just flying by the seat of your pants, like it seems to make sense, so I think I'm going to do this, versus really make a difference. But be that as it may, 
once you put these restrictions in place, now when you want to lift them, this is what the seen and the unseen, where that comes in. So if I'm the governor and I decide I think I'm going to lift the restrictions and case numbers start to go up. Now, case numbers are not the same thing as hospitalization numbers. You know, if there are a lot of young people in their 20s and 30s who get uh, infected with COVID, that'll be reflected in the case numbers. But if you're in that age group, for the most part, getting COVID is actually less dangerous than getting the flu. So uh, I'm not worried about the case numbers. I'm worrying about whether the hospitals are getting overwhelmed and when people are dying. So anyway, the, if the governor starts lifting restrictions and case numbers start going up, the press starts reporting, case numbers are going up, case numbers are going up. And of course, that's going to politically impact him. He, the governor is going to be blamed for this. So the governor's tendency, and it doesn't matter who you are, what party you're from or anything, this is human nature. If I was the governor, I'd be the same way. I'd say, you know, I'm going to maybe give it a couple of more weeks just to play it safe. I don't want to catch any flack. Mm -hmm. But what's not seen is the people who are not getting to the doctor with their congestive heart failure, not getting diagnoses of, of uh, cancer and getting their screening tests, the people who are, who are getting severely depressed and maybe overusing certain chemical substances, committing suicide, the kids who are not getting educated, particularly in lower income families where their parents may not be able to stand with them uh, at the, at the laptop to, for remote school. In fact, they may not even have Wi-Fi in their house and it could be a single parent who's got to be one of the people working to deliver food to the wealthy people who are still earning six figures doing their job on Zoom. Uh, so all these kind of things, that's not seen. And a lot of the effects of that are going to be very dispersed and maybe not even reveal themselves for a, a long period of time. So maybe a few years from now, the, when we see cancer death rates go up, and that's from now, but we may not experience it. That's the unseen. So there's going to be, a, whenever you trust an individual with control over these things, just remember, no matter who that individual is, you're creating an incentive structure that's going to make that individual want to err on the side of overcaution. And, and, and you just got to keep that in mind, which is an argument I make for minimizing, centralizing decision-making as much as is feasible in a, a national emergency. It should be as decentralized and using local knowledge as possible. I think another thing, you know, on that subject that this pandemic revealed is just in terms of, and I don't want to get too much into the legal aspect of it, but from our perspective, how powerful the governors really were. I don't think anybody was really prepared for it, right? Pretty much every state had provisions that basically said in the time of an emergency, uh, and what is an emergency? It will be determined by the government. Uh, then the government gains all these emergency powers. And I, I think everybody was scrambling to find out what the heck's the limit to all this. Um, how did these types of uh, policies affect the, the medical field? Were there mandates that were, that were overarching? Yeah, there were. Um, in the early days, even in our state, many governors put a moratorium on elective procedures. Now, the People, when they hear the word elective, they think of uh, unnecessary or cosmetic. Like, for example, getting a, a, a nose job or a facelift. That is, un, you don't have to have that right now. That could wait. But elective simply means that you don't have to do it this minute. You could plan and schedule it, but it needs to be done. So, for example, if you are discovered to have a cancer in your colon, then you need to have a surgery to get that cancer out. But it doesn't have to be done this second. It can be done in the next few weeks. It's elective, okay? Well, when the governors put a moratorium on this, this meant that a whole lot of people who needed procedures, and not just surgeries, uh, colonoscopies to diagnose cancers uh, or cardiac catheterizations to diagnose in, you know, heart vessel problems where you could have an, you'd be walking time bomb where you could get a massive heart attack and die, and you didn't know it unless you got the cardiac catheterization that showed it. All these things were put on hold. And so, again, that's part of the unseen consequences. Uh, finally, the, uh, our governor lifted that after about six weeks. Uh, some governors, after lifting it, reinstated it again when case numbers went up. Our governor, fortunately, he caught a lot of flack for it, and he didn't reinstate it when case numbers went up here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I, that's, um, that's I, to his credit, in my I, opinion. I, I remember seeing many, many instances around the country where um, the elective surgeries were mandated to be stopped entirely, and then uh, everything would open up. The governor would say, "Okay, let's try it. Let's open up. Let's let's ease restrictions on." Uh, 
you know, which, which restaurants or bars or anything would open. And then we'd see predictably, we'd see a spike, um, in a couple of weeks because people are out in the world interacting and hospitals would be completely flooded. And people were pointing to the flooded hospitals and saying, see, this is what happens when we open up too early. But then as the numbers came out, it started to show that, well, a lot of these people, 80 to 85% of these folks are the folks who have been waiting for the last four months for those elective surgeries that aren't, they're not as trivial as I'm getting a boob job or something like that. It's like maybe severe, severely needed physical therapy and, and very, very serious procedures like that. And because everything was kind of opened up at once, the hospitals in many places Mm -hmm. flooded full of these elective surgeries, not allowing the folks now newly um, infected with the with the virus to get the attention that they need. Another example of central planning is what economists call the knowledge problem, right? So you can't presume to know, you know, how much of something is necessary or uh, or anything. So in our state's example, now this doesn't apply in every state, but in the state of Arizona, our governor put a moratorium on elective surgery. I think this was about the beginning of April of 2020. It lasted about six weeks. And actually, the, the pandemic really hadn't hit Arizona very hard yet. We were re- watching on TV about New York is getting hammered, New Jersey is getting destroyed. But out west, California, Arizona, we were, there was nothing much going on here. So the hospitals were at 40% capacity during that moratorium. They were actually laying off people, okay? And then, I remember that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then the governor lifts the moratorium, and the hospital uh, volume surged up to 80% capacity. It was down to 40% with people who needed to have this done. Uh, then the next, t- next go around, he did what he should have done in the first place, which is, again, local knowledge uh, you know, at the margin. So normally, whenever there's a, 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 an epidemic of this sort, this is not that unusual. Every few years, the CDC will alert the hospitals that we're expecting a really horrible flu season this year. Better be ready. You may need to have some beds on reserve. They tell the hospitals that, and the hospitals tell the medical staff that. So what normally happens is uh, we get an advisory from our hospital administration to say, hey, guys, we're expecting a horrible season starting in about a month, so when you start scheduling stuff, please kind of keep that in mind that see what what has to be done this soon and what could wait, and we will be in touch. Um, And and we, of course, cooperate because we're all part of the, the medical staff. So... The second go around this year, when things, you know, after they lifted the restrictions, that's when the virus appeared. It was around June, right? Uh, the restrictions were play, put in place in the beginning of April, lifted in mid May, and then in June is when the virus finally arrived. <laughs> Talk about getting it wrong, right, okay? Right. Central planning, okay? So, because nobody could know, right? So the virus arrived. This time the governor said, I'm going to leave it up to the hospitals and their medical staff to deal with this. So, uh, in my practice, for example, we're a large group, and we go to multiple hospitals. So the hospital staff was in constant touch with us. They formed committees made up of the infectious disease experts on the hospital staff and administration. And there were some of the hospitals that would send out a memo saying, okay, for the next two weeks, we're going to ask you to hold off on scheduling any any uh, elective procedures that have to be in the hospital. If it's only outpatient, we can handle that. Or some hospitals are saying, you could do elective procedures, but if there's a a chance that this person might need to go to the ICU, hold off on that one because we're getting tight for ICU beds. And then other hospitals never had to do that at all. They were actually able to continue. And and then when when things lightened up at some of the hospitals that asked us to to back off, very rapidly, because they want the business, I remember one hospital that I'm very busy at, Said we're going to not let not we're going to ask you to stop scheduling all elective procedures for the next two weeks, and we'll keep you posted. And then a week later, not two weeks later, when I was expecting it, they said actually things are starting to lighten up. You can start bringing it in now. Mm. That's how markets work. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So the governor let that happen, and, and we, it worked out. I mean, there were some moments when it was getting a little kind of kind of tight there. We were getting a little nervous, but it worked out. We worked it out with our own local knowledge. The first go around, you have a situation where let's say. The hospitals in Prescott, Arizona are empty. Nobody's getting COVID around there. But those hospitals can't do elective surgery either because there was a statewide moratorium on elective surgery. So you can have a hospital in down, like University Hospital in downtown Phoenix, is swamped with all these people being flown in from remote parts of the state. So one size fits all, clunky. So why can't the people in Prescott get their colonoscopies done, even if Phoenix is swamped? 
but, but, but of no course, question. this is how it works with central planning. I want to ask you, and I, we were going to go this direction in the conversation, and the conversation went elsewhere, but I sure would like to get your feedback on telemedicine and, um, you know, how that's going to change the medical industry. Okay. Uh, well, tele, telehealth in general, I like to say telehealth because it's not just medical practice. It's very useful in things like behavioral health. You know, it's easy, very easy to conduct uh, psychological therapy uh, through something like Zoom uh, and other, and, and other th- even dentistry can be conducted using te- uh, digital technology. At least some emergency things. Obviously, you can't perform, you can't fill a cavity over the computer, but, but you could not look yet at, anyway. Right, but you could look at something and tell somebody what they need to do before they get in, until they get into the dentist's office, things like that. So, um, the, one of the earliest things that was being used by telemedicine was radiology. Uh, you could basically, nowadays, you know, that old picture, these black negatives that you put up on a screen, that's real old school. Everything is uploaded as an image in a computer screen. So a radiologist in Phoenix could read a CT scan on a patient that was just performed uh, in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, and give just as good a reading as if he was physically in Fairbanks, Alaska. So the first place we started seeing this was with radiology, which is really good for areas that, remote areas where they don't have a radiologist in the town. All right, so, but state licensing laws, once again, stood in the way of that developing because uh, in every state, including Arizona, I could only practice telehealth in the state in which I am licensed. So I could perform telehealth services to somebody, let's say, in Winslow, Arizona from here in Phoenix, but I can't uh, but but a, but a physician who is let's say in Las Vegas, Nevada, can't perform telehealth services on somebody in Kingman, Arizona, which is, you know, ridiculous. Not, you know, unless that doctor gets an Arizona license, okay? <laughs> so, or here's another example. I let's say I get some unusual, God forbid, health dis- disorder, and uh, there's this guy at UCLA Medical Center who's like the world's authority on this. I, I want to go there and get a consultation. So I, I either get on a plane or get in my car. I go to L.A. I get my consultation. The doctor prescribes uh, some medication and, and treatment regimen for me. He wants me to follow up in two months. Okay, so now I'm back in Arizona, and I can't follow up with that doctor by telehealth unless that doctor, uh, I'm not going to ask this professor at UCLA to take the time out of his day to apply for a license in Arizona for me. He's not going to do that. So I got to get back in my car or get back to the airport and fly over there for a five-minute office visit. So I, I can go to him, but he can't come to me. I mean, it makes no sense. And it also dis- disproportionately hurts lower income people because I can afford to take a plane flight there, but a lot of people can't. So, and maybe stay overnight in a hotel. So, um, uh, during the pandemic, in the great majority of states, 40 states, the governors suspended that license requirement. They just said, you can get telehealth from any licensed healthcare practitioner in the United States. And, um, and that's still going on. Hmm. Okay. That's like I say, it's been particularly helpful with behavioral health. People are getting very depressed. They have psychological problems. And most clinical psychologists and psychiatrists could tell you they could do pretty much everything they need to do without having to be in the same room with you. You know, certain body languages you can't pick up, but you can get an awful lot. You could do pretty well most of the time. So um, uh, I'm happy to say, uh, I don't want to jinx it with this conversation, but the state of Arizona, and Governor Ducey is a big booster of this, um, and I testified uh, uh, before the Senate Finance Committee here in Arizona about this. It's, it looks like they're trying to pass a law that would say that Arizonans can uh, obtain telehealth services, not just telemedicine, but telehealth from any licensed healthcare practitioner in the United States and, and the territories. I love that. Wow. Right. They don't have to get a license to practice telehealth in this state. If that happens, we will be the first we'll be state the first. to do it. This sounds like a great improvement. Yeah. yeah. But, you yeah. know. And, and, and we'll do it and we'll, everybody will see the sky won't fall and it'll yeah. probably improve accessibility. Yeah. This is great. I'm yeah. proud to be in Arizona. Yeah. And right to now. my surprise, because they're also entertaining this in Idaho and in Texas, but it's getting a lot of pushback, as you would expect, from the, the medical associations and the hospitals, not the hospitals, but the medical associations and all the other health professional associations. In Arizona, the um, Arizona Medical Association was on board. The, uh, the Arizona Nursing Association, the Hospital Association, Blue Cross, they were all on board with it, which was a really pleasant surprise. And it passed out of the Senate Finance Committee unanimously. This thing, 
it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, consider yourself on the left or on the right. Uh, this this is just too sensible. So everybody, this 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 should be easy to pass. And I hope this will serve as a template for the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, you'd ask yourself, okay, so if I could perform telehealth services with a license in any one of the 50 states, then why can't I perform personal health services? <laughs> why can't? So I could I could do it over Zoom, but I can't, let's say, if I live in Blythe, California, I'm a licensed primary care doctor in Blythe, California, and there's somebody uh, over the other side in Ehrenberg, Arizona, on the other side of the river, who is a patient of mine. He comes into Blythe to see me, but he's really sick, and I want to make a house call, but I can't because I don't have an Arizona license. So how about now extending it to the next step? It's going to follow. And yeah, I love yeah. that. And I now you've got me looking at the positive side of this pandemic. If we could change, if this could be a change that results from it, it'd be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of good things. There, are, if, if the policymakers, the lawmakers, if they pay attention, there are a lot of positive lessons that could be taken from this so that, you know, this could work out one of two ways. We could get more used to having government control or every movement and every activity and waiting for the for the quote unquote experts to tell us when when I can go outside, when I could eat, when I could hug my grandkids. Or we could also it could also turn out that a whole bunch of lawmakers say, God, we got a lot of outdated regulations that are making everything creaky and sclerotic let's get rid of this let's clean away all this dead wood so that's it could work out either of those two ways chances are it'll be a little bit of each so jeff let me ask you a broader question before we get to the end of our um, podcast today and uh i don't know how you're going to answer the answer this a very general type of a question thirty thousand foot view but what's wrong with our health care system and what would you do to fix it I think one of the, the principles, well, first of all, it's not just uh, patients directly getting health care from doctors. It's a lot, of, it's, it's complicated. The Cato Institute came out with a book two years ago that I highly recommend to listeners. It's called Overcharged, Why Americans Pay Too Much for Health Care. And it really goes into all of the different aspects because it includes, uh, you know, pharmaceutical regulations and, you know, the FDA regulations, which contributes a great deal to, to health care costs. It includes licensing laws. All this stuff is, is in there. Patents, which are gained by the drug companies to extend their monopoly status over certain drugs they develop. All of this is part of it. But the, one of the main drivers is that we have a, a, a system where the government basically punishes people if they want to use their own money to buy health insurance. And basically, through the tax structure, uh, rewards employers if they take control of a certain portion of your income in the form of your contribution to a health plan, which they control, and they purchase the health insurance. And you have no say in the matter. You have, you have no choice. And, and, they get, and that's money that you might have had in lieu, that's in lieu of money that you could have used to maybe make your own health care purchases and decisions. And, and, and then we have a third party that's picking up the overwhelming majority of the tab. So um, when, when the consumer and the producer or provider are basically cut off from the normal interaction, because normally, you know, there's the law of supply and demand. If I charge too much, then that affects your behavior. And if you, if you back off because of the higher price, that affects my behavior. But, but the third party being in, in, interspersed between the consumer and the producer doesn't allow those market forces to work. So, so the, the, basically, the, the healthcare consumer is relatively insulated from whatever the stuff costs because the, the third party is picking up the bill. And the provider's likewise insulated. Uh, oftentimes, if, you, if a doctor recommends a CAT scan and you say, well, how much is that going to cost? The doctor won't be able to tell you. The doctor never thought about it. it never, and it usually you'll say, what difference does it make? Your insurance company's going to pay for it. So those are things that drive up costs. In addition, because of our tax code and a lot of laws that were passed, we don't have health insurance in this country anymore. Because insurance was designed, it was a, it was a, it was a, um, a market response to uncertainty, it was invented, you know, a few hundred years ago in England. Actually, uh, you, you, there are certain situations where you can't predict catastrophic events, so people would basically come together to socialize the cost of catastrophic events. And so it's like betting against something bad happening, 
and you put money in a pool and somebody would calculate how much is needed in a pool. In fact, originally that's where the term underwriter comes from. In Lloyd's of London, they used to write on a chalkboard what you, what you needed insured and underneath it, they would write how much you need to put in the pot for that. And that's where the term underwriter comes from. But um, the, uh, so, so that's what insurance is supposed to be. Unforeseen catastrophic events that you can't predict are going to happen and you don't know how much they're going to cost. So you buy insurance. But it, insurance has morphed through, through the fact that you pay for health care with, after, with uh, after tax dollars, whereas if you get it through your job, it's with before tax dollars. And, and all the, like the Affordable Care Act and those other rules, now it covers everyday things, things that are not unforeseen catastrophic events. For example, colonoscopies, okay? I, if, if, it's a good idea to get a colonoscopy every seven to 10 years. Well, that's not unforeseen. You know, when you're hitting 50, you probably gotta get a colonoscopy every seven to 10 years. Just like, you know, in your car, you know that you probably ought to, you know, check the oil and the fluids every so often and get it and, and get it, bring it in for service. That's not unforeseen. So what we have now is we're asking everybody basically to pay to cover everybody's everyday expenses in healthcare, without and at the same time not making them concerned about what is really necessary and what everything costs. Because some things, you know, if 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 uh, if you knew how much it cost, you may think to yourself. Well, you know, I, I think I don't need that right now. I think I'll hold off. Are you telling me, Doc, that it's not dangerous if I hold off a year? Yeah, it's not dangerous. You, you need to get this taken care of one of these days, but not sort of like, you know, your, 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 your auto mechanic tells you your tires are starting to get thin. You're going to need a new set of tires in about 10,000 miles. That doesn't mean you got to go run out and buy tires this minute, but you kind of keep in the back of your mind, I'm going to have to get tires. Right now, I'm a little tight with money. Maybe in a couple of months, I'm expecting some more money, and that's when I'll get tires. That's how people would would engage in healthcare decisions, but there's no incentive for that right now. So that has a lot to do with the cost of healthcare. And, 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 and of course, there's, there's a lot of, there's also no accountability in healthcare because the way our system works, on, it, it's geared towards favoring fee-for-service, not that I'm against fee-for-service, but that people should have other kind of options besides fee-for-service, like integrated, vertically integrated uh, healthcare systems, like as in Kaiser, and that kind of thing. But the system actually discriminates against the development of that. And so, so uh, when our system actually rewards you for everything you do, and you don't get punished for not doing a good job. So, you know, Medicare will pay you for operating on uh, complications. But if you had a real market at work, there's a good chance a patient would say to you, okay, doc, I'll let you do the surgery, but if you have a complication, that's on you, right? Because that's how a lot of businesses are. If, you know, if you get if, if you go to a restaurant and the food came out and there's something wrong with the food, they usually what do they say? Okay, this meal's on me, or I'll give you a free dessert or something. And you don't see that in healthcare. Why? Because that's not the way the system works. The system works when you get paid for things you do. Mm -hmm. Let's ask this question. You know, I, last week I'm sitting back in chambers with a prosecutor and a judge. Um, and on a major felony case, and we're discussing the case. It's just the three of us in a small room, and the judge has got a mask on over his nose and mouth, and so does the prosecutor, and so do I. And I started the conversation with, hey, judge, have you been vaccinated? He says, yeah, yeah, I've been fully vaccinated a long time ago. I said to the prosecutor, have you been vaccinated? He says, yeah, a long time ago. And I said, me too. What are we doing, the three of us, wearing a mask over our nose and our mouth, I mean, have we gone crazy, Jeff, or am I the only one who's seeing this? And why isn't anybody saying, if you've been vaccinated, go back to your normal life? Well, in fact, the CDC is sort of saying that. They issued guidelines a few weeks ago where they said people who have been vaccinated can be with each other without wearing masks. You can invite people over your house for dinner. You can invite, if, if your grandparents, you can have your grandkids come over with, without wearing masks, you could hug, you could do all those kind of things. They even said that if you've been vaccinated, you could hang out with people who haven't been vaccinated. Now, they gave a caveat, providing those people are low risk, because there's this very, 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 very remote chance that even though you're immune, you could still 
carry the virus and give it to others. All of the evidence shows that's extremely rare. So what's going so, on? Why is there such pressure to keep wearing the masks? Is it just because, as I saw one politician say, look, if you've been vaccinated, you should still wear your mask? Because, you know, other people who haven't been vaccinated might feel uncomfortable or feel some pressure or something. Well, here's my, my st- the science says, the science says that, like what I just said, you, you know, vaccinated people can hang out together without wearing masks. Um, if you're one of those extremely rare people who might give it to somebody, well, you give it to somebody who's vaccinated, so don't worry about it. He's not going to get it anyway. But um, uh, then there's the, but there's these other issues. So first of all, a private business, if they say, and they may for business reasons, they don't want to have frightened customers. So they'll say, you know, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Okay, that's their property. Yeah, uh, I we're respect all in agreement that. with that. Yeah, no, no problem. And also, you know, in the early, as people are just getting, although we're seeing more and more vaccinations become more common, but at least in the early going, you go into a supermarket, there's no way, way of knowing how many of the maybe 100 people in there are vaccinated and how many aren't, unless you're wearing a sign or something. So, you know, you can understand how even though you don't need to wear a mask in there because you're not going to catch it from anybody because you've been vaccinated and you're not going to give it to anybody, the other people don't know that, so they may get very frightened when they see you. So just as a kind of a considerate neighbor, I, in those situations, I'd, I'd say wear a mask because, you know, I don't want to be that guy. But on the other hand, um, there are people who are just totally out of control with fear. When I see people riding a bicycle out in the open without, with a mask on or w- walking down the street in, an, in the open, th- this, first of all, the masks are not totally protective. They're just moderately or even mildly protective. Unless you're wearing an N95 mask properly that properly fits, which does protect against viruses, the other masks just reduce the amount of spray coming out of your mouth. So they are some protection, but don't get this false sense of security that as long as you're wearing a mask, you're okay. In fact, probably more effective is keeping a distance from somebody so that any spray that's getting through that person's mask doesn't get on you. Um, so that's probably more effective. I heard you. I heard you allude to something right now, and I wanted to get your feedback on this because it seems as somebody who has a, a kind of a hypersensitivity to groupthink and to social pressures and coercion, the government coercing the citizenry. I, I remember my stomach turned the day that I heard Fauci say something to the extent of, "Oh no, listen, your mask isn't for you. Your mask is for me." And other people's masks aren't for them. They're for you. You need to wear your mask to protect other people and likewise. And as soon as I heard that, I thought that's awfully convenient for a movement trying to coerce the citizenry and create social pressure and create ostracization of people who don't conform to it. It just sounds awfully, it just rubbed me the wrong way. Now, from what you just said, it sounds like you're going to tell me No, Andy, that's the case. Yeah, he's kind of right. Most of the evidence is that the masks protect others from you more than you from them because they're reducing the amount of aerosol coming out of your mouth and nose when you're breathing and talking in front of somebody. So, you know, I'm protecting that person by wearing a mask and that person's protecting me in return by wearing a mask. So that's basically it. Now, uh, when I see a person wearing a mask sitting all by themselves in their car, I can't figure out who they're protecting. (laughs) Or, again, the, there's a lot of research suggesting that even, you know, originally they said three feet. Then they said six feet. And now they're back to, at least in schools, three feet. Six feet was just an arbitrary number just pulled out of, out of thin air, okay? I, I cleaned that up. Um, but uh, the World Health Organization was saying for months, one meter. They were kind of pressured into saying six feet like everybody else over the summer. In some countries in Europe, it's five feet, two feet, three feet. Nobody really knows. Just keep a distance. But also you need, it's not just the distance, it's the amount of time face to face with that person. So when I'm walking down, and I see this so many times, I'll be walking down the street on a beautiful day, enjoying the nice weather. Nobody else on the street but me. And another person's walking down the street in the opposite direction. I'm not wearing a mask. That person isn't wearing a mask. As that person comes closer to me, that person puts on a mask for the maybe half a second mm-hmm. that we pass each other. On the, on, and of course, I have to restrain myself because I don't want to be that guy. But I feel like saying to that guy, unless I spit on you when you're walking by and breathe into your face, what are you worried about? You just 
but of course I just keep I, the, I'm, I, keep I was out in. on the hiking trail the other day and somebody hiking by me threw the mask on for a yeah, second. We're out there thing. in the middle. Yeah. But or thing. joggers wearing masks, which I Ugh. gotta think that's restricting some of your air to and, to, and to our listeners at home, I know you can't see us right now, but we are all wearing three masks right now <laughs> in the room. So don't worry about our safety. You know, Jeff, one thing I liked about what you said was no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Because to not respect that principle is to not respect freedom, right? Right, exactly. To, to make a judgment about the wisdom of the property owner's right to make the rule. You, you, you can say whatever you like about the wisdom, but they have a right to make the rule, right? Just exactly. like pe- the guy who's jogging down the road by himself has every right to wear the mask. And so, you know, it's interesting because I have had people who come into my office and they get cited for trespassing because they went into a store that required a mask. We've represented many of these in the last year. And and they're making a, what purports to be a freedom argument. I'm a free person. You have no right to tell me I got to put a mask on my face. You know, this is just a, an ignorance about yeah. the nature of freedom. And it's the a nature, property rights argument, it's a prop- which is, this is my property. I, you want to come on my property? These are the rules. I see exactly the same thing in the gun community. And you know, I've been speaking to the gun community for 25 years, but they don't like the fact that some stores say no guns allowed. And they, some of them, and of course not all of them, but some of them think it's their right, that it's a freedom thing for them to be able to take a firearm and enter a private property or, you know, business, which is still private property of someone else's against the owner's wishes. And this is as anti-freedom as any other position. And so, you know, one of the things we're doing with the Live and Let Live movement is trying to educate people about the nature of freedom and the nature of property rights. And so I'm really glad you said that. We, we think that the wisdom, and I put that in quotes, of wearing a mask while you're kind of jogging down the street all by yourself is, is foolishness. But they have every right to do it. Just like we think the wisdom of mandating masks when people enter your business. Okay, at this point in time, maybe people would say, look, it's individual responsibility. But they have every right to keep that mask policy in place as long as they like. And if you don't like it, what's your remedy? Don't go to the store, right? I mean, that's the way freedom works. And a lot of business owners, look, they want want people's business. Right. So if their sense in their community in which they're conducting their business is that people are very afraid and they're going to get more customers in their store if they require masks, then they will. As people's fear starts to subside, which is probably going to coincide with the virus the pandemic abating because of vaccinations, et cetera, then they'll get the sense that uh, more people don't want to wear a mask. They want to wear a mask and they'll lighten it up. They just want happy customers. They want to make money. Wouldn't this have been the better rule from the beginning, from the very beginning for the governor to say, look, if I'll, I'll make the decision over government property, but the private business owner will make the decision about whether to wear masks or not. And then the consumers will pass judgment on that business's decision about the masks. Seems like that would have been the uh, way to deal with this that was consistent with the principles of freedom, the live and let live principle, and the principle of really that what America was based on in the first place. Excellent point right. to close out the discussion today. Um, we've been talking to Dr. Jeff Singer. Um, we've been having a fantastic conversation full of great insights um, from uh, this uh, senior fellow with the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., who's been uh, practicing as a general private surgeon since 1981. Excellent conversation about uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, as well as many other great insights from Dr. Singer. Um, And uh, do you have any contact information, website, anything like that we can share with our listeners? Sure, thanks. Uh, First of all, you you can go to the Cato website, which is cato.org. We have a lot of Great scholars. We cover the whole waterfront of policy issues from foreign policy to cyber security policy, to you name it. And uh, um, if you look at the very top of the page, you'll see experts. You can click on that. And in, it'll be a, in, in, in alphabetical order, will be every one of our uh, experts, our scholars at the think tank. You click on that page and it gets you to the bio page. You'll find me there and it lists every, it has all of the, my work, including media work. Uh, that you could look at. Um, we've done a lot of, the, in the healthcare policy studies department, there's a lot of books and studies that we've done, like I just mentioned, overcharged. 
Um, and uh, my email, well, my, my Twitter handle, that's probably more useful. My Twitter handle is at dr number four liberty at doctor for liberty you can follow me on twitter i love it it's like attorneys for freedom and doctor for liberty you know what i think jeff came up with that first i got it first and he jeff got it first i saw doctor for liberty and i thought you know what attorney for freedom works just as well for me and so uh that's kind of that spawned the, really the name of this law firm i'm g- kind of disillusioned now i've been working <laughs> here for seven years and had no idea you had stolen the name from the good doctor he was, he was inspired <laughs> i was inspired that's a better way to uh, put theft it yeah. is the highest form of flattery right there you go all right well we're closing up the show now and uh keep in mind you can always get a hold of us check out attorneysforfreedom.com Email us. Our uh, email addresses are Andy, A-N-D-Y, at attorneysforfreedom.com. Mark, M-A-R-C, at attorneysforfreedom.com. And we love hearing from you guys, especially if you disagree with us. We love answering your questions. We love talking about uh, viewer uh, feedback and listener feedback on the show while on the podcast. And we'd love to take all your questions. Keep sending them to us. If you want to learn more about the Live and Let Live movement, it's liveandletlive.org for this podcast and many more. And uh, we sure did enjoy our conversation today. Thank you guys very much. This is the Attorneys for Freedom signing out. Peace. Peace.